Welcome again to our program titled The Violation of the Coming King. As you know that this program is a part of a long series, 26 programs, in which we try to cover those major themes of the book of Revelation. And we already talked, and you could notice that sometimes it's frustrating when you try in a short time to cover such a complex book and visions and, and the text of the book of Revelation in such short time. And praise God for that. The purpose of this program is simply, dear viewers, to stimulate your appetite for the Word of God. Once this program is, is over, we would like to encourage you to go and to study the book of Revelation for yourself. And we have provided a good tool for you. By the way, this is our textbook. It's infallible word of God. When you follow the instructions of this book, you can find here the answers to many, many difficult um, parts of the book of Revelation. But we need also some other tools. And uh, all the lectures that we have here follow this uh, book, which is actually verse by verse commentary on the book of Revelation titled Revelation of Jesus Christ. So as you know, every time I'm giving you pages from this commentary that once this program is over, you can go and continue to study for yourself. So our uh, lecture today is based on the pages that from 343, 343, going all up to page um, 364. 364. So we would like really to encourage you that, that once this program is over, that you go and you continue to study for yourself. Let me introduce myself. I'm Ranko Stefanovic, professor at the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary, Andrews University. And I'm so thrilled to be here. I want to express my deep gratitude to 3ABM, making possible tape this, this series so that we can give you today that the best insights that we as the church have into this very, very important book to our mission and to our destiny. I'm so glad to have a wonderful audience and excellent crew here. Actually, they are also part of my audience. I see that they are listening very carefully what is presented here. But you know about all, we need the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We can do our best, but without God's help, we are nothing. It is, it is he who inspired John on Patmos there, giving him these visions, and it's the Holy Spirit who can help us in understanding of this difficult text of, of the Bible. So I'd like to ask you to bow your heads for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your guidance. Thank you for your help. Thank you for showing your care for us, telling us about the things that will happen in the last days before the coming of our Savior Jesus Christ in power and glory. Father, we are asking this moment as we are going to understand one of the easy chapters of the book of Revelation, please give us your Holy Spirit and open our minds that we get understanding of this text which is according to your will. We pray all of this in the precious name of our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Last time, we saw in the conclusion of chapter 10, a special experience that John had in the vision. John is usually a passive observer, but there are several times in the book of Revelation when he is an active participant. In the conclusion of chapter 10, verses 8 to 11, we see John actively participating there in the vision. Do you remember that? He was given, uh, he was actually requested to go there to that angel who was holding that little scroll, telling him, take the scroll and eat it. I hope that our view viewers understand that the entire vision is symbolical. You don't eat papyrus scroll, huh? Yeah. It has a symbolical meaning. So if this is a symbolic, also John, and his action of taking the scroll and eating it, it must be symbolic. So the entire vision, 
the setting of which is between the sixth and the seventh trumpet is actually telling us about the future from John's perspective, about the time when there will be Christians who like to understand those sealed prophecies of the book of Daniel. They will take those prophecies, they will digest them. It will be so sweet in their mouth as honey. But once they digest it, they identify themselves with that message. And they try to share that message to the hostile world. They will experience the bitter aspect of that message because of the persecution and the, what they will experience in the world. I hope that we are keeping this in mind because the, the, the vision moves on. You know, so many times when you are studying the Bible, um, and, and I see so many times the readers of the Bible did not understand that when the Bible was originally written, um, the inspired authors did not divide the Bible into chapters and verses. And so many times we limit our study just to one chapter, forgetting, okay, that the text continues in the following chapter. This is exactly what we have here. John did not, did not make a line dividing the vision into two parts. That's what we uh, are doing this because of convenience, so that we can m much easier handle the, bibli the biblical text. So the vision goes on. So please keep in mind, John is still a participant. Okay? I would like you to turn your, your, your Bibles to Revelation chapter 11. We are moving to the next chapter, but keep in mind, once again, this is the same vision. John is still participating there in the vision. Okay, chapter 11, verse 1. Then, you see, after that experience of eating the scroll, there was given me a measuring rod, like a staff. And someone said, get up and measure the temple of God and the altar, and those who worship it. Probably you are now surprised. <laughs> what is this all about? What does it have with the previous experience of John when he picked up that scroll and then he ate it and experiencing that sweet, bitter effect of the scroll? Now John was given a measuring rod and he was commanded to measure the temple of God the altar and the worshipers. Please, I would like you to keep in mind that the three things John was supposed to measure. What was that? The temple of God, the altar, and the worshipers. There is one Old Testament text that really helps us to understand what this vision is, is, is all about. The more Old Testament text, we will we'll point to them a little bit later. But the prophet Ezekiel, centuries earlier, okay, he had a very similar vision and participation like, like John. I will not read this text, but I want to mention this text so to encourage you that you can go and, and, and delve into that text, you know, after this program is over. It's actually the vision of prophet Ezekiel, and it's recorded in, in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 40, 40. Verse 3 to chapter 43, verse 12. Ezekiel saw the temple of God, and he was given a measuring rod to measure the temple. Very similar to what we find here in Revelation 11. What was the purpose of the measuring temple in the book of Ezekiel? You see, the vision was a strong message, an assurance to God's people who were about to come out of the exile, to go back to Palestine, okay, that God will restore the temple and the temple services. So it was a strong assurance to God's people there in the promised land. So the rebuilding of the temple was God's attempt to restore his relationships with, 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 with the people. That was the purpose in Ezekiel. So Ezekiel's vision gave us a clue to the meaning of the measuring temple in, in John, John's vision. Let's go a little bit to see this in details. What is the temple here? If you go to the New Testament, 
you can find that the temple can mean several things. Sometimes the temple stands as a symbol for the church. And I can give you many verses. By the way, I was reminded that sometimes when there, is, there are so many biblical evidences and references that I, I should remind you to tell you that you can find all those Bible references in that commentary that I introduced at the beginning. There is much more. We don't mention just a few verses here during this presentation. You can find literally 100 and 100 different Bible references. Okay, so the symbol of the church. However, the concept of the church as the temple does not fit into the context of Revelation chapter, chapter 11. Why not? You will ask your question. Keep in mind that John was supposed to measure that temple. What else? The altar and those who worship in it. Who are those who worship in it? That's the church. So the temple cannot mean, cannot mean, mean the church. Are you, are you still with me? Second thing is, so believers are mentioned there. The church is mentioned there. Neither the temple in Jerusalem is in view because the temple was destroyed about 20 years earlier. There is only one understanding that really fits the context of the book of Revelation is the heavenly temple, the temple that, that is there in heaven. By the way, when you study the book of Revelation, you can see that the book of Revelation is saturated with the references to the temple and the articles of furniture there, there in the heavenly temple. There is the temple there in heaven. According to the New Testament, and, and, and please, we would need now a lot of time to go just to some basic text of, of the New Testament, especially the book of Hebrews is telling us that there is their temple in heaven where Jesus is doing his ministry and intercession on behalf of his, of his people. So this is the temple in heaven there that John was commanded to measure. But what is the meaning of this, of this measuring? Keep in mind, this is related to what? To John's eating of the scroll, okay? This is a section that follows John, John's previous, previous experience. Keep in mind, the three elements are specially emphasized here to be measured. What is that? One more time. The temple, the altar, and the worshipers. Actually, we have a number of an excellent study, of excellent studies. You can find all the references and the articles here in my commentary there that show that in the Old Testament, in association with the earthly temple that was established in Jerusalem, when these three entities are mentioned, is the temple, the altar, and the worshipers. These three entities are found only once together with reference to the Day of Atonement. Only once. Okay. So the Day of Atonement in the Old Testament was the most solemn day of the Jewish sacred calendar. It was day of measuring or a judgment when God ultimately had to deal with the sins of his people. So the Old Testament day of atonement is the backdrop for Revelation 11.1. 1. By the way, you will notice here that the key word that is used here is get up and measure the temple and the worshipers. Keep in mind, the book of Revelation is a symbolic book. In the Bible, the word measure can figuratively be used, and it's used frequently to evaluate or judge. For instance, you can go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, where Paul is using that word to show that actually to measure, it means to judge somebody. In the Old Testament, the word is used as a manner of deciding who will live and who will die, like in the case of David in 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse 2, or in the book of Isaiah 65, verse 7. To, God measures his people. It means that he judges the sins of his, of his people. But I would like you to invite you that you turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verse 2. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verse 2. 
And this is probably the classical text that Jesus used. Okay? The word measure in order to show that it really means judgment. Okay? Chapter 7, verse 2. For in the... Let, let's, let's actually start with verse 1. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. Keep in mind. What is in verse 1? Don't judge. So you will not be judged. Did you see that? But let's go now to verse 2. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. Repetition. But watch out. By your standard of measure, or in, 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 as, in, as in Greek stated, is the way you measure others, it will be measured to you. Did you see that? The way you judge, you'll be judged. The way you measure... You will be measured. Actually, Jesus is using the word measure or to measure as a synonym for to judge. So what are we talking here about? What is this measuring of the temple, <laughs> of the altar, and the worshiper, or worshipers all about? It deals with the concept of judgment. In the concept of, of judgment. I would like to suggest to you, to the readers, we don't have a time now to go into details of that. According to the Bible and in the book of Revelation, this concept is so well emphasized. Is that prior to the second coming of Christ, there is the so-called pre-advent judgment. When people will be measured, and on the base of that measuring, they'll be decided who will enter the God's kingdom and who will be left, left out. By the way, I would like to suggest to you that this measuring that we have here in the Revelation chapter, chapter 11 parallels to Revelation chapter, chapter 7, verses 23, which actually is equivalent for sealing. You see, those who are measured, okay, that at the same time sealed. They belong, they belong to God's people. And that's why the great emphasis is given as the central point of the preaching of that everlasting gospel, the first angel message. Fear God and give him glory for the hour of his judgment has come. Dear viewers, I just want to encourage you. I'm here touching the surface. Please take all these tools. There are many other commentaries that can help you that you study this topic more for self. Believe me, we can spend now several hours just talking about this subject. And I'm tempted to go into that. But I see there, there that clock is running, running too fast there. But the main point of the entire vision is what? Let's go back. John ate the scroll. <laughs> okay? It was so sweet in his mouth but it became bitter. It is after eating the scroll and experiencing that sweet, bitter taste of that, now John was commanded. Do you remember that? What was he commanded? In the last verse of chapter 10. You still have to go to prophesy. Prophesy, it's equivalent to preaching. You still have to go to preach. When you proclaim to the people about the future events, you're prophesying. But you see, that proclamation of the gospel, that prophesying, According to Revelation chapter 11, verse, verses two, uh, 1 and 2, is given in the context of the heavenly sanctuary, of Christ's ministry, what Jesus is doing there in the heavenly places on behalf of human, human beings. Actually, this verse is, is, is telling us that, that the, the heavenly sanctuary and what is going there has a great significance for God's sovereignty. Yes. During the history of sin on earth, God's character as well as his governance has been challenged, challenged by Satan. However, the heavenly sanctuary is the message to vindicate God's character before the entire universe and restore his rightful rule over the universe. As such, it gives us a new dimension to the meaning of the gospel. And the gospel message... That everlasting gospel is supposed to be preached at the time of the end. It gets a full significance and a meaning in light of 
what Jesus Christ is doing there in the heavenly places on behalf of his people who are supposed one day to enter against. And I just want to tell you, tell you viewers, here and there I have some people, they question if the doctrine sanctuary, it's really biblical. Believe me, it's a biblical. Amen. There are so many texts that we cannot mention it. And it's telling us that any gospel proclamation done at the time of the end must be done within the framework of what Jesus is doing there Amen. on behalf of us and ministering on behalf of us that work of intercession there in the heavenly sanctuary. Amen. It's a beautiful message. But you see, the text goes on and we read it and it says, verse 2, leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it. Keep in mind, what was supposed to be measured? <laughs> the temple, the altar, and the worshipers. But suddenly John hears, don't measure the court. Why not? For it has been given to the, my Bible says, to the nations. Maybe you viewers, some of you have the text that says it was given to the Gentiles. I will explain it just in a few minutes. And they, nations or Gentiles, they will tread uh, uh, um, underfoot the holy city for 42 months. Again, we have a difficult text that really seeks a lot, a lot of attention that we, that we have is here. John was told what to measure, but he was told what not to measure. And it was the court. Actually, um, in the in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem Temple, Jerusalem Temple, uh, the outside court was in front there of the of the of the temple. You know, it was in that court that there was the altar of sacrifice. By the way, in the first century, while the Jerusalem Temple still stood, and John knew it very very well, that was the only place in Jerusalem temple where the Gentiles could come. If anybody would like to go to the next court, which was called the court of the Israelites, there was a huge inscription there that any Gentile who would dare to go to pass through this, through his gate, will be responsible for his own death. So the Gentiles were allowed to be only in the, in the outer, outer court. By the way, we will come to, to Revelation chapter 22, once the sin is abolished, finally the Gentiles will have that free access to God. Amen. Okay, But we have here some very interesting prophecy. By the way, let me mention here that the word, the key word here that is used is the word ethnoi. What does come to your mind? The word ethnic. Actually, the word simply means nations. It's a plural. If you replace this with S, you have ethnos, which means a nation. Okay. You know, the entire concept comes from the Old Testament. You have Israel and you have the nations. You have Israel and then you have the nations. And in the New Testament times, the word for nations actually is understood today in English as the Gentiles. It means all those who are not God's people. Okay, so God's people and everybody and everybody else. You will notice here that the text that the text says that that outer court where Gentiles were present, the nations were present. It was not supposed to be measured. Why not? Because it was given to the Gentiles for how long? For how long? If you go to, to verse 2, it says, it was given for 42 months. Do you remember we just, we mentioned in our last presentation is that 42 months is one of the several time designations in the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, which is 1,260 days, time, two times, and half a time, and similar, okay? Several, several times, they all mean the same period, the period of the Middle Ages that is right, rightly counted from the year 538 A.D. 
until the events of French Revolution in 1798. You see, it says that the court, which actually stands as a symbol for the earth, keep in mind, the earth was not supposed to be measured, only the heavenly temple and the altar and the worshipers, because God's people are the ones who are worshiping there in the heavenly temple. They are present there as Jesus ministers on behalf of them. But the earth during that period was not supposed to be measured. Why not? Because it says the holy city and the court will be given to the nations. Nations. Who are those nations? By the way, in the book of Revelation, nations are always those who are not God's people. <laughs> They're usually hostile to God and, and, and God's pe people. By the way, there is another expression in the book of Revelation that refers to them. I just want to mention some texts. 610, 813, 1110, 13, 8, and 14, 17, 2, etc., etc. The expression that is used, the inhabitants of the earth or those who dwell on the earth. You see, God's people in the book of Revelation are always in the heavenly places. They live here. But the existence is there, with Jesus there in the heavenly, in heavenly sanctuary. While everybody else is here on, the, on this earth. But Jesus said, don't measure the earth. Why? Because the holy city will, give, will be given to the nations and they will trample over the city for 42 months, the prophetic 1,260 days. What is this all about? Are you confused? Of course. We are dealing with very difficult text of the Bible, but there is one text. Oh boy, there is something that during these lectures we can understand is how much is important to let the Bible interpret itself, Amen. rather than to use allegorical imagination and, and, and find our ideas and read, read in the text. Let's go to that text which is actually the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 21, verse 24. Uh, you will notice that in chapter 21 there, uh, Jesus is about to die on the cross. And he's dealing with the rejection of Jerusalem and the people who lived there. Despite the fact that Jesus did everything, to bring them back to God, okay? And now Jesus is making that prophecy, okay? With reference to Jerusalem, which is evidently the key to the understanding what's going on in Revelation 11 2. So the Gospel of Luke chapter 21, verse 22, Jesus said, talking about destruction of Jerusalem, okay? He says, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all the nations, ethnoi all nations, okay? And Jerusalem will be trampled under the foot by the Gentiles. It's the same expression that is found in Revelation 11 too. The Jerusalem will be trampled under the foot of the ethnoi of the land. He said, under the foot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. See, Jesus talks about destruction of Jerusalem, and this destruction of Jerusalem would follow what? Would follow one period. Jesus talks about the times which must be fulfilled when the holy city, Jerusalem, would be trampled under the foot of the Gentiles. By the way, Jesus does not specify um, the length of this period. He only says, until the times are fulfilled. Time given to the Gentiles are fulfilled. But the book of Revelation, chapter 11, verse 2, specifies clearly that the time allotted to those ethnoids is actually 42 months. The prophetic period of 1,260 days. No question is that actually Jesus, as he does in Matthew 24, as, are you still with me? As Jesus is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, at the same time, he takes Jerusalem as a foreshadow, as a foretaste of the entire world will experience in the future prior to the second coming of Christ. That's why it's so difficult to read Matthew 24. You don't know if Jesus is talking about Jerusalem or he's talking about the entire world. And the answer is yes. Amen. 
Jesus talks primarily about Jerusalem, but at the same time, he uses Jerusalem as a symbol, okay, of the entire world. That's why it's so difficult to read Matthew 24. The same happens here, because this is the same speech that Jesus made, but this detail Matthew does not record. And Jesus says, the Jerusalem will be destroyed, and after that it will be trampled under the foot of the Gentiles for a certain period of time, which in Revelation is specified at 42 months. So Jesus is moving from the literal city of Jerusalem to the sim its symbolic meaning with reference to the, to, the entire, to the entire world. Actually, specifically with reference to God's faithful, faithful people. And no question that actually this text from Luke 21 give us a clue of what we read in the Revelation chapter 11, verse 2. By the way, if you go to the book of Daniel chapter 7, then when we go to the book of Revelation chapter 13, whenever this period of 42 months, 1260 days, or time, two times, and a half of time are mentioned, there are always one common denominator. And what is that? It's the power of the Antichrist that will be involved in the persecution of God's people. So the holy city here in particular is the reference to God's people who will be persecuted during certain certain period. God says, don't measure the earth. It's given to the Gentiles. They are already under the judgment of God. They don't need to be measured in that pre-advent judgment that is found in chapter 11, 11 verse, verse 2. But here we have actually the explanation about that be, uh, bitter taste of that little scroll and what God's people will experience in this world. They belong to God. They are measured. They are ready for God's kingdom. But we have here an announcement that is actually elaborated in detail in chapter 13 is that God's people will have to go for a long period of the dark Middle and Middle Ages. Some of them will have to suffer martyrdom and not just the sun. Many, many of them. But these texts give us an assurance that nothing happens in this world without knowledge of God. He is still in control. Yes, God's people, they have to go through certain period of a trials. Some of them, they really have to pay their testimony and witness to the gospel by martyrdom. But God is still in control. God's people are provided with assurance that their names are written there in heaven. Amen. You remember what Jesus said, don't be afraid of those who just kill your body. Be afraid of the one who can take your soul. You can take you as whole as a person and throw you there, there in hell. Praise God, the book of Revelation is not a book about those drastic and bizarre events. It's about God who cares about his people. Yes, we have all those things that so many times they don't sound nice. They are recorded in the book of Revelation, but not to make us afraid, to make us care. It's just for a simple reason, to provide assurance that God is still with his people. He'll always be present, present with them. And whatever happens to God's people, he's still in control. We can trust our, our, our God. And that's why we, we will come more to this concept when we come to Revelation chapter 13. Because this trampling of the holy city during the period of 42 months or 1260 days, it's really explained in more details in Revelation chapter 13, 1 to 10. And we will deal with that when we, when we come to Revelation chapter 13 there. Now, the text, the text moves on and it says, and I, verse 3, and I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days closed in sackcloth. Let me ask you something. Did you notice something? A common expression that ties the, the two verses, verse 2 and verse 3. What is that that ties the two verses together? It's the same time period. Did you notice it? In verse 2, we have that the holy city will be trampled under the full, uh, foot 
uh, of, the, of the Gentiles for 42 months. But during the same period, during the same period, we have a two witnesses that will carry that testimony on behalf of the gospel during the period of 1260 days. They are closed in seclos. Do you see that? It's during the, we are dealing with the same period. Friends, did you notice something? This is what amazes me about the book of Revelation. How so many times we are eager to focus on something that the book of Revelation shows an insignificant to be distracted from something that is very significant. You see, we have just one verse is telling us that during this prophetic period, there will be severe persecution of, of God's people. The gen that's what Gentiles will be doing. This is what Satan will be doing during this period. But go all from verse 3 until the end of chapter, actually to verse 14, he talks us about what God is doing during this period. He's sending his witnesses who will have to carry the witness carry to, uh, uh, the, uh, the witness to the, to, the, to, the, to the gospel is. Really, the book of Revelation is something else than we try, than, uh, from that that we try to find, to find there, there in the text. Is. Yeah, Satan will be doing his, his, his work. But this is what God will be doing. God always has his people, and through them he tried to warn the world of the situation, calling them back to God and telling them to worship the only true God and to have that future with God because he is the one who holds the, who holds the future. Amen. So the two witnesses, okay. There are few things here that are, that are very interesting. Two witnesses here are mentioned. It says they will prophesy, okay, for um, 1260 days, they're closed in sackcloth, now John tried to provide the identification of these two witnesses, telling us these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire flows out of their mouth and devours their enemies. So if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. These have the power to shut up the sky so that the rain will not fall during the days of the prophesying. And they have a power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire. Please allow me to stay for a few minutes because in three, these, uh, how many? Three, four verses. We have the identification of these uh, two, two witnesses. Let's just point to a few things. Two witnesses. What does come to your mind when the word two witnesses is read there in the, in, the, in, in, the, in the Bible? If you go to the Old Testament, for instance, the book of Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15, you will read that in ancient Israel, the judicial system always functioned on the testimony of two witnesses, two or three witnesses. By the way, Jesus repeats that rule in the Gospel of John 8, 17. And you will find in the, in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 18, Jesus talks um, when, when the church is dealing with the erring brother in the church. You have to look for two or three witnesses to help you in working with that, with that, with that brother. By the way, when Jesus sent his disciples to preach the Gospel, how did he do it? He sent them two by two. Why? Because the preaching is credible when you have two witnesses uh, to that gospel. And that's why we, when you read in the book of Acts, Apostle Paul never went alone to preach the gospel. Peter never alone. They're always two by two to preach the gospel. You have to understand why. Because in the Jewish mind, when you have two people giving testimony to the same thing, it has credibility. So here you are dealing here with the two witnesses. It says they're dressed in the sackcloth. In the Old Testament, the sackcloth is a regular dress of the Israelite prophets. Notice that in verse 10, in verse 10, if you read it, these two witnesses are, are called the prophets. Furthermore, the sackcloth is also the garment of mourning. So the portrayal of the two witnesses 
okay? It's giving the testimony, okay? And prophesying is sackcloth during the pro prophetic period of 1260 days. It's talking about a special situation with the, in which they are. They're going through the period of persecution, okay? A difficult time for God's people as they are trying to uphold the standard of the Bible and to proclaim the gospel message to the world. Friends, it is here. This sackcloth gives us another aspect of that bitter taste of that scroll that John tasted in Revelation, Revelation chapter, chapter 10. Now, John is giving us the clue who actually these two witnesses are. And he is referring to the book of Zechariah, chapter 4 and verse 2, because the expression that is found here in verse 4, these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands. It goes back to Ze Zechariah, where Zechariah saw two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the Lord of the earth. John is using this language from Zechariah, pointing to the book of Zechariah. Because in Zechariah, the two olive trees, they represented the two anointed ones in verse 14. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 14. Standing by the Lord of the earth. And th who are those two anointed ones? This Joshua, the high priest, and Zerubbabel, the governor of Judea. They were two anointed ones. Okay? So the activities of these two witnesses resembles the roles of Joshua and Zerubbabel in the, in the Old Testament. Because these two witnesses are portrayed in priestly and royal terms. But there is something, something more that you, you, you can notice it. Please, now you can be with me in verses 6 and 7. They said, actually 5 and 6, sorry. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire flows out of their mouth and devours their enemies. So if anyone wants to harm them, he must be, um, he must be killed in this way. What does suddenly come to your mind as, as you read this text? By the way, if you go to the, to the, to the Old Testament, you probably remember in 2 Kings chapter, nine, uh, chapter 1, verses 9 to 14, when Elijah was supposed to be arrested by the evil king Ahab. And suddenly, a fire f fell from heaven upon the soldiers who came to arrest him. So this is allusion to Elijah. But there is, a, there is much more in verse, verse 6. These have the power to shut up the sky. What has come to your mind? Okay, let's go there. So that the rain will not fall during the days of the prophesying. Please, what were the days of the prophesying? 1260 days. How long was the famine in Israel during, during uh, um, the prophet Elijah? It's three and a half years, which is 1260 days. Okay, okay. what are we talking here about? There is, there is much more. Let's go to verse 6. And they had power over the waters to turn them into the blood. What does suddenly come to your mind? Moses and, and Exodus, what happened there in Egypt? And to strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire. What plagues are we talking here about? The plagues of, of Egypt. So see, you see, friends, what we have here is that these two witnesses are portrayed after the images of Moses and Elijah in the Old Testament. What Moses and Elijah were doing there in the spirit of God, trying to bring unfaithful Israel back to God, so these two witnesses have the same characteristics in the same spirit. They're carrying the witness to the gospel during this period of 1260 days. Their ministry resembles to the role of Joshua and Zerubbabel in the rebuilding of the temple. You remember we talk about the temple in, in, in verse 1. So now there is a question. Who are the two witnesses? And if you take different commentators, you will see how the Bible commentators are divided. What are the two possibilities? There are really two possibilities. One is the two witnesses represent God's people in the twofold role, uh, uh, role as 
priests and kings in the Old Testament. The ones who carry the gospel. However, there is another possibility. And this is in the history of Seventh-day Adventist Church. Is that actually these two witnesses, they stand a symbol for the Bible. Now the question is, which one of the two views are correct? The answer is yes. I believe that both views are, are, are described here. By the way, if you go later to the text, you will, you, will, you, will see, you will see there that actually it talks in verse 8, in verse 8, and their bodies, keep in mind, in my Bible says, and their bodies will lie in the street of the great city. By the way, in Greek, it says, and their body. Keep in mind, you're dealing with two entities which actually makes one entity. So now you'll ask the question, how these two witnesses can be both the symbol of God's people in the Bible? Tell me, what is the Bible with God's people? The Bible itself will not proclaim the gospel. So I believe here we have a powerful testimony of God's people with the Bible in their hands. Proclaiming that gospel, okay, to the world. And the preaching of that gospel God wants to reach people, to reach people, people for, for themselves. We're talking about that powerful testimony of the Bible being preached during the dark Middle, middle Ages. But then we move on. In verse, verses 8, no, verse 7 and 8, we read, when those two witnesses have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them and kill them and their body will lie in the street of the great city which mystically is called Sodom and Egypt when also the Lord was crucified and those from the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations will look at that, that body for three and a half days and will not permit their dead body to be led in the tomb and those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate and they will send gifts to another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the, on the earth. What will happen at the end of this prophetic period of prophesying of two witnesses? It talks here about the beast that will come out of the abyss. You remember we already mentioned with reference to the fifth trumpet, that the abyss is the place where Satan and the demons are locked up there after being cast out, out, out from heaven. So talking about the beast, actually commissioned by Satan and wages the war against two witnesses and actually kills the two, the two witnesses and says that the body of these two witnesses, one body, the two witnesses, is on the street of the great city exposed there. And that city is mystically, symbolically called Sodom and Egypt, when also their Lord was crucified. Let's first talk about the great city. In the book of Revelation, there is one great city, which is actually Babylon. But if you go to the Old Testament, there are many great cities. I've not listed them now. There are many of them. But those great cities, there is one thing that characterize, characterizes all those great cities. And what is that? They are always involved in persecuting God's people. By the way, you will notice that the great city that is mentioned here has the characteristic of several cities. Sodom. Okay? Did you, did you notice it? So we are dealing with city that really is characterized by the wickedness and the moral degradation of Sodom. But also he said it's called, how else? Egypt. What was the characteristic of Egypt? Do you remember Pharaoh? It's atheism. Atheistic arrogance of Egypt. Who is God that I should, ob that I should obey him? But there is also the third characteristic of this city. It says that also their Lord was crucified. I'm referring to verse, to verse 8. Okay. So also the rebellious condition of Jerusalem. You see, you're dealing here with political entity because in the book of Revelation, the beast stands for political power. You're dealing with political power that is wicked, okay? 
that has atheistic characteristics. And it's rebellious against God and his system like what happened, happened to, Je to Jerusalem. Now there is a question, then who is this entity, entity and what is this entity? Friends, there is only one political entity that fits the history that really made the war with the religion, with the church, and with the Bible that fits the historical context, and that's France and the French Revolution that made a great effort with the abolishment of the Bible and to replace the traditional religion and the gospel message with humanism, atheistic uh, stand, okay, and making war to the Bible and everything, everything what is, what is religion. This prophecy of Revelation chapter, chapter 11 was actually accurately fulfilled in the events of French Revolution. And everything what happened during, during, during the time when really the Bible was then done away with that, with that system. An attempt was made really to do away with the Bible and the entire world rejo rejoiced. Unfortunately, this is what happens when people try to read off of that religious intolerance of the Middle Ages. People step on the wrong ground. They're not doing with that problem. They usually blame God, they blame the Bible, and they blame the gospel message. And actually, this is indeed what happened with events, events of the French Revolution and causing the events of the sixth, uh, fifth and the sixth trumpet, actually, that we talked in our two previous, previous, previous lesson there. And now it says, the conscience of the people was calm now. Because, the, uh, please, please, pay attention here, something is. Verse 9, verse, no, actually verse 10. It says, and those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate, and they will send gifts to one another, because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Boy, in the Bible, God's people are very, very often blamed for many bad situations in which people find themselves. And people think when they read off with God's people, <laughs> they will rest with their conscience and they will find, they'll find the peace. By the way, you, you will remember when that famine was in Israel. You remember Ahab when he said to, to, to Elijah, are you the one? who is bringing trouble to Israel. It's very interesting is that people get into trouble because they do away with the gospel, they turn away from God, and when they find themselves into the trouble, who are those to be blamed? Those who are with God. It has been always in history. But very soon, people realize they cannot do away with God. You can kick out God from your life, you can put the Bible into the flame. You can try to destroy everything that even comes close to religion. But very soon, human beings, they must understand that they cannot do away with God. Amen. Actually, this is exactly what happens here. Because this celebration and what happens with the events of the French Revolution did not last for too long. Let's, let's keep on. Verse 11. I like the first word. Do you have the first word? It says, but. I like that but. By the way, my famous sermon that I preached, favorite sermon that I preached, is titled, But. We are sinners. But. We are lost. But. We suffer. But. People try to do away with the Bible, the religion. But. Let's read. After the three and a half days, the breath of life from God came into them. And they stood on their feet, and great fear fell upon those who were watching them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to into heaven, and the cloud in their enemies watched them. In that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified, and they gave glory to God of heaven. The second war is past. Behold, the third war is coming, coming soon. After three and a half days, God breathes life into the witnesses and resurrects them. 
cause. This is a strong allusion to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, when God created Adam. And the whole scene reminds that valley with the dry bones in the vision of book of Ezekiel chapter 30, 37. People thought they have done away with those two witnesses. They have done away with the Bible and silenced the witness that tormented their conscience. However, the word of God always triumphs. Then the sight of the enemies, the resurrected witnesses are miraculously taken to heaven on a cloud. This is an exaltation of the two witnesses, okay? From the accumulated, previous accumulated uh, situation, adds to the terror experienced by the earth dwellers. Friends, historically, one of the outcomes of French Revolution was a great revival interest of the Bible. It's very interesting, yes. This is what Satan tried to do. But God always triumphs. And that great interest resulted in that, that we have the establishment of the great Bible societies, led to different missionary movements, organized simply for one and the same purpose, to take the Bible and the gospel message and to proclaim it to the world. All of these we have the following, the dark Middle Ages and the events of, of French Revolution. The two witnesses thus came back to life. The stage was set for the widespread preaching of the gospel is. Yes. It's, it's talking about 7,000 people who were killed, but says, but there are other people who really repented. We are dealing here with a small part of that great city that really came to recognize God. By the way, this lead to the, to the, to the, to the conclusion is that the time of the end, even though Satan wanted to prevent the preaching of the gospel, at the time of the end, God will triumph. Because according to Revelation chapter 14, verse 7, there'll be one more time that the great proclamation of that gospel message to the world.